Thank you for being here today. If you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. We've been in an odd little series here. Uh, We've been looking at the Old Testament offerings. And the one we speak about this morning, I believe, I know, are the most critical of those offerings for mankind. The offerings that deal with the cleansing from God. The cleansing from God. We've seen how the picture of all of the offerings are important in our understanding of Jesus Christ. However, today's offering shows us the necessity that every person that's ever lived on the face of the earth needs cleansing from God. The first week, we looked at the offerings that dealt with our commitment to God in the burnt offering and the meat offering. In the second week, we looked at the peace offering and how it dealt with the communion with God. However, an Old Testament Israelite could have been as committed as they wanted to be, and they could have desired to be in communion with God as much as they wanted, and it would have meant very little if they were not cleansed from their sin. And it's the same with us today. These two final offerings that we're going to look at today are the sin offering and the trespass offering. Both of them deal with the atonement for sin. Now, that's a big word we don't use a lot anymore. But in, the, in referencing the Old Testament, atonement meant that a blood sacrifice would cover the sin. But for the Old Testament, we'll see it was a temporal remission, of an earthly remission of that punishment. So first today, I want us to look at the sacrifice. Look at these sacrifices, the sin offering and the trespass offering. Stick with me here in verse chapter 4, and we'll explain this as, after we've read these. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock, he gives now the details, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and they shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. And shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle. And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering. And it explains all that just similar to what we saw of the peace offering. Verse 10, and as it was taken off from the bullock for the sacrifice of the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of the burnt offering. Now verse 11, this is different here. And the skin of the bullock and all the, his flesh and his head and with his leg and his inwards and his dung, even the whole bullock shall, be, shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt. Now turn over to chapter 6. That was the sin offering. Now we see here the trespass offering. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or if found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, in any of these things that a man doeth, sinning therein. Then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, and and the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or which he hath delivered him to keep, or lost the thing which he found, or all all about which he hath sworn falsely. He shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto. 
and give it unto him in whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish of the flock, out of the flock, with thy estimate for a trespass unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for any for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you now to uh, help us to understand and see the picture of this in Jesus Christ that, we, that you have given us today. Open our hearts to your word. Be with those that don't know Christ as their Savior, that they would see today their need for a Savior in Jesus Christ. Be with us that are Christians, that we would, we would gain a, a deeper understanding of what our Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, and that we would gain from this as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll look at these sacrifices. That's a lot of detail and what's going on there. So let's talk about this. We'll look at these two offerings. We're going to look at them at the same time because they basically are held to the same law, the law that was given. Now, what's the difference first between a sin offering and a trespass offering? Well, as you see there, a sin offering deals with the guilt of sin. What I've done, the guilt of that sin. Where the trespass offering is how the damage of that sin. When you sin, it causes damage on others. When I sin, it hurts other people. And there's a, there's a damage portion, and that's what he's talking about with the trespass offering. Now, the sin offering was made by different groups of people. It was made by the priests when they sinned. It was made by the nation. If the whole nation sinned, if it's made by a ruler or individual people. The trespass offering was only, though, for one person, each individual. Because when I sin, I sin against someone else. And that, that sin that the, the individuals will, will be dealing with that. So let's look at this and some of the larger details. The sin offering was broken down by who was making the sacrifice. The higher the position the person was in life, the more expensive the sacrifice that was expected. Now this principle is throughout the word of God, both in the New Testament as well. The principle is that the greater the privilege, the more the responsibility you carry. And the larger the consequences of your sin. When someone that is a leader, they fail, it causes a ripple effect through society, does it not? So we see that here in this, in this offering. We see the different things that were offered. They're, they're more of more value. The priest, he brought a young bullock. The congregation, the elders would come around identifying with that uh, for the nation, and they would give of a bullock. The ruler would give a male kid goat. You can read these, uh, the verses all through chapter uh, 4 and 5. The common person, they could give a female goat. Uh, I don't, the difference between a male goat and a female goat, they were more plentiful and uh, cheaper to buy. A poor person. So anyone could do this. God doesn't leave it, leave it out to where only certain people could be forgiven. No, anyone could be. So it keeps going down. The common person to go to. A poor person could just give two turtle doves or two pigeons. And if they were just extremely destitute, they could give an ephah of fine flour. So they could just give the flour that they had and a measurement of that. Now, within these sacrifices, all the sacrifices had to be without blemish. We've talked about this through the different offerings. It was always without blemish. The guilty party, once again, would put their hand on the offering and they would identify, they were literally, the thinking here is, or the picture of it more, was a transfer of their sin onto the sacrificial animal. And then they would slit the throat of that animal and they would kill that sacrifice. It was a substitutive uh, death. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 tells us without shedding of blood is no remission. There is no remission of sin. In this case, the whole nation, all the elders, one of each of the tribes, they would come around and they would put their hands on that animal, identifying the nation had sinned. Now, something different that occurs here. In the case of the priest or the nation, the priest would do something different than any other offering. The priest would take of that blood... He would go into the holy place within the tabernacle and it says he would sprinkle the blood seven times against the veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies. 
He would then put blood on the horns right outside that. We're going to see this in a minute. Right outside that was an altar of incense. And he would put blood on the horns that were on the sides of that table, the altar of sweet incense. Now, go ahead and put that up there if you don't mind. In the tabernacle, this is that rectangle there, the large rectangle, that represents the perimeter of the tabernacle. There's hundreds of details we could go into. We're only going to share just a couple here to make our point. You see then the triangle within there. There is a large room. The rest of that is open for the most part. There's the burnt offering on the, the, the altar on the right. But on the left, you'll see this room that's broken into two different rooms. On the right side is called the holy place. On the left side is called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented the, uh, the presence of God. And it was separated by a tapestry, which they say was about a hand's breadth wide. Very large tapestry. And it separated this veil from the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was represented, and the holy place. And in the holy place, we find there three things. A lampstand that was always lit, representing the Holy Spirit's illumination. Then on the top, you see the table of showbread, representing many things, but the Word of God. And then the table, right before the, the curtain, is the table, the altar of incense. And when they would put fire on that, the aroma, the, the, the incense would rise up. And any time you read of incense, it typically represents the prayers of people going up. All of this is symbolism, right? This is symbolism of what's going on here. And he tells them that you're supposed to go in there. Now, there's many other details, but just to paint this picture. The priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood seven times perfection against the, this veil. This sin offering, the sin offering blood of the priest or the nation. Because sin is an offense to God. Sin is an offense to the holiness of God. So before a holy God can hear you and to see you, the holy presence needed to receive the sacrificial blood. Also, when we see sin affects our prayer life. So the, the sacrificial blood was put on that altar so that it covered the sin, the prayers would be heard before God. Now, this is all symbolism. You don't understand this. And we're going to come back and explain what this all represents. Next was the atonement. Very similar to the peace offering. The, it talks about how the fat and all of those things were taken off. They were put on the altar of burnt offering. And they were burned there. All right? Those, those were put there. This was very similar to several of the other offerings. But... The final step is what separates us from every other offering. You still with me? Okay, two of you are. That's good. Shake your heads. Yes, we're here. All right, I'm getting there. This one separates it from all of the other offerings. Everything else was done in the tabernacle. This was not. The, the fat was burned just like the other ones, but this time, the remaining offering, the hide, all of the meat, all of the internals, they were taken outside of the camp, not just the tabernacle, they were taken outside of the camp to a clean place, and there the offering was burned. God makes a clear distinction between the sin offering that was made for cleansing and the burnt offering which was made for commitment. Also, this is, I believe, more important, the people that were unholy because of their sin, they were unfit for a holy sin offering to be burned in their presence. The sin offering was too holy to remain in an unholy camp. So it was taken outside of the camp to be burned. This is crucial, and we're going to see in just a few minutes. So stick with me. I keep saying that, and we'll see how this applies to us today. So there was the sin offering that dealt with the guilt of our sin. Next, we have the trespass offering that deals with the damage of sin. This happens in two different ways. One, if we trespassed against the holy things of God. This is speaking to the Jews. 
ignorantly uh, violating a sacrifice. Uh, they just didn't know they did that. Or violating some celebration or vow or holy day, uh, some commandment that went along with that. As you could see all these rules, it would be very easy to forget one of those and to do that ignorantly. The other one would be against our fellow man, and we see that in Leviticus chapter 6. When you lie, you steal, steal uh, deceit. I don't know how you steal and not know you did that, but nonetheless, that's, that's what he's saying here. In this sacrifice, there is that element of restitution. I've done something against you, and I'm going to restore that. I, I've stolen I stole Rick's bike, okay? And uh, Rick and I neither ride bikes, okay? And uh, I restore his bike. Or I, I've taken something from him, and there's one more element to that. In that restitution, there is a cost. There is a sacrifice of a ram. You first confess the trespass, obviously, then the the ram. But then you also add 20% to the value of it. So it costs the person something. There was dam If it was damaged, you would restore the value of whatever it was plus 20%. That, that money or that item would be given to the priest. That priest would then give it to the person or give it back to, to the family if that person was no longer there. And it shows two things. It shows first that it is, there is a costly nature to committing sin. We in this world in, in America today, we seem to like something happens, we just go off and we find a new group of friends or we find a new whatever this might be. No, 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 there is a costly price to sin. And this whole restoring and adding 20% was to get that across in the mind. It also shows by giving this ram sacrifice a costly nature for God to cleanse our sin. The shedding of blood. No one's sin only affects themselves. It affects others and it affects God. And when we truly repent... When we truly repent of a sin in our life, it should bring about a desire to make things right. Restitution, trying to make things right in our life. And the, and the Lord helps us, and as, as Christians, the Lord comes alongside, the Holy Spirit mends and heals and helps us in that. So these are the two offerings. These are the last of the two offerings, the sin offering for the guilt of sin, the trespass offering for the, uh, the, da- the damage that has been done by that sin. But now, may we move out of the shadows, and I want us to look at the last of the sacrifices, Jesus Christ. All of these have been pointing to Jesus Christ, and this one specifically does today. The shadow of a key cannot unlock a door. Would we agree? And the shadow of a meal, we're all hungry, right? Cannot satisfy our hunger. Well, also, the shadow of Calvary cannot take away sin. Now, it could cover it for a while, but it cannot take away sin. In Hebrews 10.1, if you want, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews, because we're going to be there for the remainder of the sermon. It says, For then would they not, speaking of these sacrifices, we see, for for the law having a shadow of good things to come. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. He's telling them, It didn't do the job. It just covered the sin. And all of these sacrifices were a picture or a shadow pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sin. As we continue reading down in verse 4, he tells us, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If they would have done the job, why would they have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. But... In those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is impossible, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. The key there, it is not possible to take away sins. 
The sacrificing of a temporal or, or an earthly atoning here is a covering of sin. Just a putting a, a basket over it, a something over it. it. It doesn't take it away, it just covers it. And from the first man, God had set up this, that there was the need for the remission of sin. There had to be the shedding of blood from Adam when he was there and had to be covered in his body after the first sin. It moved on to Noah, and when he came off the ark, there was the sacrifices that were made there. And now we have Moses that was putting it into the law. The bloody sacrifices, and they prefigured the offering of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now see this picture, and we're going to go by each one of these. The animal that was sacrificed was innocent. Our Lord and Savior was innocent and was, was, uh, died for our sins. The animal came and was meek and lowly, right? It was a sheep or a bull, and it was meek and lowly. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ and Isaiah was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. The animal was to come, and they were to be without blemish. There was to be nothing, no sin in them. And Jesus Christ came as the sinless Son of God, undefiled and without spot. The offerer would come, and they would put their hand on that animal, and it would represent the transferring of their sin onto that animal. Our sin was transferred onto Jesus Christ when it says He took on the iniquity of us all. Amen? The animal was slain. Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world and he marched to Calvary and died in our place. The animal bled and died. Jesus Christ was crucified. His side was pierced. The animal's blood was sprinkled on the, on the veil. Jesus' blood was shed for us. Hebrews 9.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats or, cal or calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for all. The animal was burned on the altar. Jesus Christ suffered, and the groanings of the cross very similar. Now here's the most important part for you and I. The animal was burned outside the camp, outside of Judaism. He suffered and was sacrificed, not just for the nation of the Jews, but he was outside the camp. He was sacrificed outside on the hill called Calvary. He suffered and died for the people of every nation, you, me, everyone that's ever been born. It tells us in 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's you and me. He died for us all. Where animal sacrifices only covered man's sin, Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of the perfect man, he washed it away forever. Our sins are gone once and for all. If you continue in chapter 10 of Hebrews, it says, the last part of that verse, through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That is, the, that is the Lord, that is the Savior that we praise. That is the one we believe in. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Remember back in verse 7, it says there, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. That's what we're reading. Leviticus, that's part of the volume of the book. And it is telling us what Jesus Christ did. The culmination of God's revelation was to provide a way of escape for you and for me, for mankind, all of us, to restore us in that fellowship with Him. The great sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, on, on the cross. As in all generations, though, as in all ages, as we talked about the person putting their hand on that offering, each person must identify with the sacrifice. Get the symbolism there. As the people would identify with that sacrifice to take their sin upon them, figuratively, 
Jesus didn't do it figuratively. He did it completely. And we must identify ourselves with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There needs to be an understanding and an acknowledgement that you, that I, am a sinner. An understanding that my sin has separated me from a holy God. That your sin has separated you from a holy God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There also needs to be a realization that apart from the sacrifice, Jesus Christ Because of that sin, you will die in your sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. So will you believe that Jesus died in your place? Identify with him. Your sin being placed on him. First Peter says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Romans 10.9, familiar verses to some, says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and unto the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The belief in confession is identifying in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. It's also trusting in the fact that Christ died and was raised conquering sin and death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Friend, it's no mistake you're here today or watching or you've come upon this at some other time as you're on on the internet. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? God is holy, and God is just. So their sin must be paid for. The payment is the shedding of blood in death. It is either our own, or it is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. God is holy, God is just, but God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I said that for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Today is the day to do that. Before we end today, I want to mention one other thing. We've seen these sacrifices and how they point to Jesus Christ as our Savior. But there's one last aspect, very quickly, that I want us as Christians to see here. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, I want you to see the longevity of the sacrifice. Now, the beauty of this, I I couldn't pass it up. In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 11, speaks of what was going to be done, after all of those sacrifices were made, there were ashes. Ashes, the leftovers. And he talks about what was to be done with the ashes. The ashes from the sin offering and the trespass and the and the peace and the meal and the burn, all of these offerings. What would the Lord have done with those? It tells us that they were collected and they were taken to a very specific place outside the camp to a clean place. All right? They weren't thrown in the water. They weren't, they weren't, there was a very specific place they went. Now let me ask you something. How many of you have a fire pit or something like that around your house? All right. Uh, how many have a grill that you actually burn something on versus, all right, versus just gas? All right. At the end of that, there are ashes. Right? They're there. And you can You can take a flame to them. You could try to heat them up. They will never catch fire again. Right? Everything that was in them has been burned. There's nothing left to burn. Now, Christians, please see this. God's eternal wrath on you and I is complete. In Christ's substitutionary work, 
Jesus Christ died on the cross for us and we have accepted Christ as our Savior and there is no more of God's wrath on our life. There is nothing that can, re- that can rekindle God's eternal wrath towards you. Jesus' crucifixion satisfied the payment for sin. And we then have eternal security in Jesus Christ. We see this is consistent with the love of Jesus Christ. Because of Christ, we see that even the end time wrath and tribulation, we will not see. We see that the eternal wrath, we will not see. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. That is awesome. The story is told of a, of a farmer uh, in the, mid, in the um, fields of the Midwest. And the great, a great prairie fire fire was going across there, and uh, out of a stroke of wisdom, he saw it was approaching um, a few miles away, and he went out into one of the fields, and he made a huge circle, and he burned everything within that circle, and as the fire started to come toward their, toward their property, he gathered his entire family, and they went into the center of the circle, And as that fire came, sure enough, it burned everything around them, but nothing happened to them. Why? They were secure because there was nothing left to burn. As Christians, we stand where the fire has already been. Jesus' loving and sacrificial gift took our place to the glory of God. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with those that are here today that maybe don't know Christ as their Savior, that they would see through these different offerings that we've mentioned, that they would see specifically in this sin offering how you took our place, how Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sin, and as we identify with him, as he took the sin away from us, dear Heavenly Father, that we would call out to you and that we would accept Christ as our Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us as Christians, that we would be encouraged of what we've seen and that we would, we would put our trust in you. We would continue to uh, let that grow in our life and knowing that uh, the work is complete and that should we could have courage from that to grow and to do your will. Be with us now, dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen.